Okay, perfect. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for artwork. Now what? How to develop a career as an emerging artist with Kasia Sosnowski. My name is Angeline Simon and I'll be your moderator for today's session. First, we would like to acknowledge that our session is being streamed from Lethbridge, which is situated on traditional Blackfoot Confederacy territory. We pay respect to the Blackfoot people, past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. The city of Lethbridge is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. This is our 10th session of artwork delivered on Zoom. We appreciate the continued support from the arts community and tuning into these PD sessions. All the sessions are on our YouTube channel, which you can find by just searching AAC Leth. I would like to mention that we are also recording today's session and uploading it to our YouTube channel. We will be sharing it with everyone who has registered today. If you haven't already done so, please introduce yourself in the chat box. If you're an artist, please let us know about your practice. There will be time following the presentation for questions, if you have any. Please enter those into the chat box and then we will get to them after the presentation is over. On the webinar, we also have Tara Galanders, our membership and projects manager. Tara will now speak to us about the Allied Arts Council and I'm just gonna share my screen here. Okay, Tara. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tara Glanders, and I'm the Projects and Membership Manager for the Allied Arts Council. I would just like to tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we are a 63-year-old multidisciplinary arts services organization. We operate CASA, which is a large community arts center here in Lethbridge, which has a robust gallery and arts education program. We also manage AAC Works on 7th Street, which is a fine arts and craft store as well. We organize a variety of events such as the Art of Giving, Arts Days, Christmas at CASA, and we put on artwork. These are ongoing professional development series. Uh, we sit on multiple city committees and we collaborate with other arts focused organizations and ensure that the arts are advocated for here in Lethbridge and in southern Alberta. We are a member supported organization so if you uh, would like to become a member that would be great. Artist membership is $25 and friend membership is only $15. Numbers are important especially right now during these challenging times so if you're interested in becoming a member you can contact Angeline uh, or myself or just go to our website www.artslethbridge.org. And now I would like to introduce you tonight's uh, presenter. Uh, Kasia Sosnowski is originally from Calgary, Alberta. Uh, she moved to Lethbridge in 2007. She graduated with honors from the University of Lethbridge and a Bachelor of Fine Arts, Art History Museum Studies and a Bachelor of Fine Arts, Art Studio in 2014. She moved to Banff in 2014, where she worked at the Banff Center as a preparatorial practicum at the Walter Phillips Gallery. After completing her year contract as a practicum, she participated in the Banff Center's late fall fair program, where she began exploring ceramics. In 2020, she attended a two-month residency at Medalta in the historic Clay District in Medicine Hat, Alberta, to work for her project Sneaky Peepin, which was shown in the project space at the Esker Foundation in Calgary. She uh, now lives and works in Cal uh, Lethbridge, Alberta, where she maintains her art practice, and she is currently working towards upcoming exhibitions in 2021. I would also like to add that Kasha works for the Allied Arts Council as the AAC Works Manager, and as well, she sits on the Public Art Committee for Lethbridge. Uh, take it away, Kasha. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I know it's sort of the cusp before the long weekend, so I'll try to keep it relatively brief, and then hopefully you all can ask questions as they come up, um, and we can answer them at the end. So I'm just going to share my screen and get this party party going. There we go. Can you all see that? So as Tara mentioned, I work at the Allied Arts Council. I'm the AAC Works Manager. I sit on the Public Art Committee. 
Um, and I maintain an art practice while having a full-time job. And so I'm by no means an expert, but I think I've learned a little bit through trial and error and through my uh, roles on a couple of juries and kind of understanding how that application process works. Um, I'm a visual artist primarily, so I'm gonna speak mostly to that, but I think all of this can be applied across a couple of disciplines. So sort of as a joke, I've called this like, now what? Um, because I'm sure a lot of you are recent grads or artists who are just starting and getting your leg up in this industry. And it can be definitely overwhelming to negotiate an art community or to enter the art world, especially if you're coming from an institution where things are sort of um, scheduled or have sort of a system to it. Or if you are not coming from any training that can be difficult to negotiate as well. So. Um, I think it's all a little bit like, now what do I do? Now I have this, I enjoy doing this stuff, I like making work, but now how do I infiltrate this system? I think it's really important to, off the bat, kind of identify what you're looking for as an artist, what types of experiences you want to cultivate for yourselves, what opportunities you want to seek out, what type of connection you're looking for. Um, I, someone once told me that they're just looking to live a rich and full life and that being an artist offers that kind of possibility to them for travel, meeting new, meeting new people, exploring ideas and exploring creativity, um, also kind of researching and having that ability to just live a full life. So I think like making it is maybe an interesting thing to talk about as how to, how to kind of identify what you as an emerging artist might be most interested in pursuing. That way you can maybe streamline your efforts and time, which are finite resources into avenues that you find the most uh, fulfilling for yourself. So I've made sort of a very rough list of things that might be considered success, which could be connecting with community and peers and students using art as a tool to connect and educate. Um, it could be a way to engage in meaningful dialogues and social commentary or activism using your practice as a way to uh, subvert systems or to be a bit maybe mischievous and like start a revolution if you want, who knows. It could be really about exploring materials and concepts and idea and it could be actually quite insular, quite private. It doesn't have to be public. You can just gain that kind of um, satisfaction through exploring those things on your own. It could be about selling or marketing your work and making a living off of your practice, which could look a little bit like teaching workshops or selling ceramics or jewelry or fiber pieces online. It could be exhibiting your work and making the majority of your income through uh, artist fees and grants and things like that. It could be working in an arts institution using your design uh, capabilities, curatorial skills or writing skills to help an institution um, provide these types of roles for other people. Or it could be as simple as exploring opportunities as they come, uh, surprising yourself, challenging yourself, uh, taking on things that scare you, like giving artist talks and challenging yourself and finding out a little bit about yourself and your practice through that process. Um, I think uh, something that I just want to talk about at the, at the beginning are things that I have personally found surprising as I've negotiated my art career is how much time is spent doing arts administration, is spent writing, applying for grants, looking for opportunities, doing research, um, coordinating between galleries and coordinating between uh, other artists, put submitting applications. A lot of it is spent tickety tacketing away on your computer or on your laptop. It's not, it's not this like romantic idea of in the studio. And I think for me, identifying this as necessary work in order to maybe have a stronger studio practice is, is important. Um, I, what I want to talk about just at the very beginning are some of these really structural foundational admin things that need to, you need to get out of the way so that you can spend more time in the studio, hopefully. Um, and just to kind of general overview, like I think it's important to know that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are tons of resources out there 
about how to do this, um, how to format applications, how to, uh, you know, do all these sorts of things. So I think relying on people who have the expertise or relying on uh, resources that are otherwise available, it, it can feel overwhelming to, to start from scratch as an emerging artist, but I think understanding that there are tools in a, that I will also talk about later, but tools and resources that are available to kind of help you through this process. So I think to kind of begin um, to talk about some essential living documents that you kind of need to have in your arsenal as, as you negotiate through this process as an emerging artist, um, a CV or, or like an artist kind of resume, an artist statement is really important, a biography, which is hopefully easy, but should still be readily available and on hand having documentation of your work, whatever it might be. Um, I'm, I call them living documents only because they should kind of change and grow as you as an artist change and grow and develop your career. They, they don't have to be set in stone. That's something that I think tripped me up early on is wanting them to be perfect, but not really recognizing that my ideas will change and my thoughts will change and experiences change the way that you approach things. So these documents setting the format and the foundation is really important, but then allowing them to kind of grow and be malleable is just something that I didn't really think about until I had to put this talk together. So if, if CV is kind of a, a name or a word that you haven't really heard of, again, it's sort of an artist, um, like an artist resume, a curriculum vitae, which actually means course of life, which I thought was sort of interesting and something that I learned. Um, it just is like a Coles Notes version of all of your, your arts related experience, whether it's education or teaching or publications you've been in or self self made zines that you've been in. Um, I think sometimes this can be overwhelming because if you're an emerging artist, you might not necessarily have an exhibition record. And so it becomes this catch 22. How do you have a CV if you don't have this experience? Um, and I think it's definitely difficult to navigate, but something that I did when I was still in university was not flub it, but I think um, whenever I had a, a critique and I was installing work in a space, I would put that on my CV as a mini exhibition and I would recognize, I would document it with a camera and I would record it in my CV and I'd be very transparent that it was um, a, a show called Show Me Your Ugly Babies. And it was in the University of Lethbridge eighth floor exhibition hallway. And I think it, it, it does a couple of things. If you have a documentation record and if you have it on your CV, it kind of can, can show that you're thinking about this non, a non-traditional space or a non-conventional space with the same weight as you would like a gallery or a institution or something like that. Um, eventually maybe they'll fall away and you won't, you won't have them on your CV as, as you do show in other places. But I think it's, it, you kind of have to make it, not make it up, but you kind of have to just allow for that to be a legitimate space, especially as you're starting out. And you can create those spaces for yourself as well. Um, this is just a shot of my CV and to kind of illustrate the point that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I, I borrowed this format from a friend of mine who I thought the format was nice. I thought it was clean. It really just has to be a readable document that outlines all of your uh, art experience, whether it's working in arts admin or it's grants that you've won or residencies you've attended or shows that you've put on with your friends in a non-institutional um, space. And I actually do, uh, actually, I figured out earlier how to do laser pointer, but here I actually have, I didn't realize this, I still have a show, student exhibition space at the University of Lethbridge, Art, like the University of Lethbridge. I think it just shows that you're thinking about your work in a more, in a larger way. Um, so artist statements, again, another one of these living documents that can kind of grow and shift and change, but is really necessary for you to have to be able to pull out in, in a hot second when you need it to submit a proposal. I think it's a little more difficult to negotiate than a CV, which is really 
pretty straightforward um, because an arts artist statement is kind is quite personal. It's about what you're interested in. Um, but I think it's really important to to outline exa exactly as I said, what in what ideas are you interested in? Do you work with specific materials? Um, I think a mistake I made early on with artist statements is to make them overly academic and really theoretical to prove that I was making work that was serious and important. And it ended up not sounding like me. I, I, I do like flirting with theoretical ideas and I like large concepts, but I was writing about it in, in a way that wasn't authentic to myself and wasn't authentic to myself as an artist. Um, making it understandable, as Calvin points out, if it's incomprehensible, it means that you're profound. I think that there's a lot of um, merit in being able to communicate difficult conversations very clearly to a wide variety of audiences. And that I think is a very important thing to be able to do. And it's kind of, it's quite hard to do, but I think it's definitely something that you should strive for in your artist statement. And again, just recognizing that it's a document that will change as you change. And that when you read an artist statement from seven years ago, it'll be like reading your eighth grade diary. And that can be very embarrassing, but necessary. Um, again, I kind of just wanted to talk about a couple of resources because one of those living documents or those, those main components you need kind of in your back pocket are, is how to document your work. And so I thought I would just again, plug the artwork series, um, all available on YouTube. Professionals and people with, with expertise are telling you their experience about how to do things successfully. They're kind of revealing the process. Um, we have right here, Beyond the Square, documenting your work, how to do it at home with um, tools, with your iPhone, with your, with, with your lamp. Like you don't need expensive equipment necessarily to take documentation that is striking. But we also have how to apply for artist residencies, how to submit a proposal, which goes more into depth than what I'm talking about today and is with the curator of the gallery at CASA. So again, this is a resource that I think it exists. You don't have to struggle and find it out, find out all these things on your own. There are things that exist that hopefully can remove some of those barriers or some of that, that feeling, those feelings of uh, intimidation, which I, I think are very, very real. Um, so this is, like, as I've mentioned before, I, I've, sit, I've had the privilege to sit on a jury, jur multiple juries, which I think reveals this application process a little bit more clearly. But if you're an emerging artist and you're applying for things, it can almost feel like you're sending it into a black void of space. And then, then you hear whether or not you, it, your application was successful or not without really understanding what people are looking for. So. I'm hoping to a little bit reveal some of the things that I've noticed or some of the things that I look for when I'm on the jury as both an artist and a juror. It's, it's provided me a lot of insight on what to do and maybe what to avoid. Um, so this is the cheat sheet. Again, I think one of the most, one of the things that people might overlook is, is, is following criteria for applications, really listening when they say, we need 10 images of your work, not submitting 57, because if there are, if there's a large applicant pool, the applications that don't follow the, the that criteria will be kind of just dismissed and not, not really examined. And that's, that's a really basic kind of beginner kind of follow the criteria. <laughs> um, I think it also just proves that you're, you're listening to what they want, you're responding if they have particular asks, if they're looking to see why you're interested in that particular gallery, then you address that because oftentimes they'll they'll look for those, those types of lines through your application. Again, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but having good quality images of your work, if if you're a visual artist or if if you're if you're selling your work in any kind of way, images are really like going to take you to the bank because they can co often communicate things that are hard to verbalize, and it can really be 
um, seductive to see a beautiful image of your work. It, it, it almost speaks for itself, you could say. Um, I, I would suggest talking about ideas and concepts, but also being really clear in your proposal and grounding those in, in reality. Jur jurors, jurors, the rural jurors, uh, jurors, I think, just want to have an understanding of what your application is going to be. So the more clearly they can understand it, then the more, more comfortable they'll feel like approving that application or not. Um, I think it's also okay if, I think a lot of the time you can go to a gallery or a submission with an idea of a project and it, it's okay to admit what stage you're in or to acknowledge the way that you like to work. If you are a process-based artist, recognizing that I don't have what it's going to look like, but in the past, my work has looked like this and I'll be working with ideas of in this sort of parameter. I think that's more than okay. Just being really upfront and transparent about your process and the way you work about things, work things through your head. I think it's really important. Again, my cheesy sort of answer, what kind of work are you interested in? What work are you interested in making? Be really authentic to who you are. Um, it can be hard to find your voice. And I think that slowly happens um, across like a long while, but once you do realize that, what's more attractive than somebody talking about something they love so much? It's, it's infectious. So you're the only person who can make the work you make. You're the authority on your work. So you should speak to what that looks like. And then another sort of practical thing, um, have someone you trust read it over. Because oftentimes uh, our practice is so intimate that you, you understand what's going to happen and you understand the process and what it's going to look like, but a cold read from somebody might allow for you to expand on an idea um, or to give a more clear example uh, because that person hasn't been with you as you've developed this in your brain. And another sort of practical kind of uh, trick is if you have a good idea, modify it and send it to multiple galleries, multiple applications, multiple grants, um, because your idea might be good and, and, and might be great. And it could just be about playing the numbers game and having, uh, having, having there be maybe more aspects or more things to consider with your application. It's not that the idea is bad, it's that there were 75 applicants for two spaces. Um, so if you're applying to more than one place though, also keep in mind to modify the criteria because often, um, often different galleries will ask for different specs. They'll ask for five images versus seven. So just make sure that you also have their names correctly because sending an application to uh, MoMA that says you're applying for the gallery at CASA will really just kind of knock you out the running. Um, also, so, so you're ready to apply, you kind of have this package ready. Where do you look and where do you apply for? I, I mean, I'm, I'm from Lethbridge and I've been kind of developing my career mostly here. Um, and so I can really speak more intimately to Lethbridge sites, but I think uh, the Allied Arts Council has an excellent e-newsletter. We collect opportunities across a wide range of practices. So you can see if you're a dancer, certain calls for that. If you're looking for galleries for printmakers, or if you're looking for opportunities as a media artist, the AAC kind of collects these and sends them out to artist members. But I think it's similar with other artist-based organizations across Canada. If you find somebody who's kept collecting and collating these opportunities, then you're kind of like, you're a little bit more tuned in and you can kind of pick and choose the opportunities that suit you best. Um, in Lethbridge, again, if you're looking for places to show, CASA is super great. The gallery at CASA has the main spaces, but also smaller auxiliary spaces, um, which are really great to kind of get messy and play around in, especially if you're an emerging artist. Uh, brick and mortar is a commercial gallery setting where you, you display kind of traditional work and sell it. AAC Works is the retail space that I manage downtown and we sell local handmade pieces of all sorts. Um, I also think that you can create your own space to kind of display your work. So that's always something to consider. Um, 
a little bit more broadly and thinking a little bit more provincially and globally or nationally, Akimbo is a super great resource. It has residencies, uh, artist opportunities, jobs, if you're looking for art jobs, different gallery or exhibition openings that are happening around, calls for writers. It's, it really is as large as you want it and can be scaled by location. And then the Alberta Association of Artist Run Centers is super nice. It's a list of all the artist run centers in Alberta and artist run centers are a really wonderful place for emerging artists because they are a little less formal. They are often run by one or two people. So it's, it's a little bit less intimidating. And they're always also excited. They're excited and are made to support emerging artists, whatever their age, wherever they're coming from. I think they're also always looking for ideas that might be against the norm or not traditional in, in the ways that we might think about work. Um, <laughs> so this is, if you're, if people are looking for you, where are they going to find you? And are you going to make it easy for them to find your work? Again, this is, this is targeted to people who, if you're interested in showing your work, if you're, if you're happy to make work in the privacy of your home or in your home studio, and you're really just content to, to kind of work away, that is more than more than okay. But this is, this is sort of like if you want to tap into these other avenues. I mean, not to be this person, but social media is really a great, can be a great resource. It's a tool. It can be used in a lot of different ways and it can be used how you want and utilized how you want. You can show off your work. You can show behind the scenes processes. You, it can be a little bit messy, a bit playful. You can work out ideas. You can connect with community. I've, I, re, I, I, I find a lot of people working in similar ways and just finding inspiration from people who are working in ceramics, who know more than I do. It's, it's just kind of, it can be really inspiring and really exciting. Um, and I think it's also a way, if you are coming out of like an institutional space where you've had this cohort of people working really closely, social media can be kind of, a way to keep connected with those people, but to also develop new community and to tap into new connections that way. You can also follow gallery spaces, artist run centers, and be get heads up about calls that are happening that way. I think I think people are using social media as it's intended to connect you to opportunities. Um, I think the uh, we've. I think also to kind of counter the playfulness and, and fluidity of social media, having an artist website is really, can kind of be really important. Um, it's again, like a living space for maybe documents for all of those living documents I've been talking about. Your CV can live there, documentation can live there. Your artist, uh, your artist statement can live there and it can be malleable. This is just a shot of, of my website and, and it's, Again, it's sort of like drawing on resources of other artists and seeing what I like in formatting. It can be an extension of your art practice. It doesn't have to be so rigid and it does offer the opportunities to, you could sell your work from your website. You can connect to other social media platforms that you might have, your Vimeo, your TikTok, if you're making things on there. Like, I think that there's an opportunity for it being a platform for which people can jump off and find you in other, in other places. Um, I think now one of the hardest parts when I was asking my friends, like what's the hardest part about transitioning from an institution and out or being an emerging artist is where do you find community? Where do you find people to connect with? And I think, um, I think connection looks a lot different these days. It's mediated through social media, through internet and Zoom and Discord. This is me and my family playing uh, a, a session of D&D &D and my, my babcha showed up and we were just all chatting. But I think one of the only good things to come out of this year is that courses, workshops, lectures are more accessible. You can, you can take part of them in them at home. Um, and so that opportunity to kind of meet people or try new things or learn new things is is kind of cracked wide open you can ac access these things in in multiple different ways and connection is different and i'm not saying it's the same but i think that it, there is 
there are ways to do it. And in some ways it, it, it's a little bit more accessible. <laughs> so I've spent a lot of time talking about art admin because I think that's often the part that you, that, well, it's the part that I forgot about that you, that's something that you need to maintain. Um, but I think it's really important to balance art admin with making art. And honestly, I feel like if all of your administrative things are tucked away and ready and available, it gives you more time to make work. I work a full-time job and it's really unglamorous and unromantic to schedule time to get into the studio or to make work or to, to, to play around with watercolors. Um, but I think we can also expand the way making work looks like or what research looks like if art is a representation of you and your experiences and your thought process, then things you read, things you watch, people that you have conversations with, they're all going to kind of bleed into this pool of making art. And I know as a ceramic artist primarily, it's, it's sort of hard to have that space. So I think even just thinking about things or trying to think about your practice in an expanded way or to build up your arsenal of uh, resources by attending workshops or lectures really can help. Also this spent, I spent so long putting this together cause she's marrying them. She's marrying making art and art admin. I thought that was funny. Sorry guys. Um, so another kind of big challenge. Just listening to Abba and Sram's studio. But one of the hardest things about leaving an institution is finding the space again to make work. And here I'm going to shamelessly plug uh, CASA, the Community Art Center in Lethbridge, for its, so it has excellent facilities, ceramics. I mean, we're closed right now because of COVID, but I think everything is sort of closed. Um, but it has, when we reopen, there are ceramic studios, 2D studios, printmaking, uh, fiber studios and dyeing of uh, black, uh, dark room, not a black room, a wood shop. It's, it really is a fantastic, fantastic place. And a little bit of like Googling, if you're not from Lethbridge can kind of point out other studios that are offering similar things. And, that, and then working in these spaces can be another way to kind of connect with your community and connect with other artists who are using those, those sites. Um, let's see. Also, the staff is really great. The staff is amazing. I don't work. At, I don't work in Casa, but the staff there are really great. Um, I think also, when when you're an emerging artist, it can it can feel like this is the thing I do. I I do um, ceramics. Let's use that as an example. But often, if you're feeling stuck or unmotivated, I think that's a real challenge as an emerging artist. Feeling like you're you're doing one thing, you're trying one thing, but I think it's also worth it to not take it too seriously and to play around, try different materials, take a course. Uh, CASA, as I mentioned, offers adult classes for printmaking. I've never done printmaking before and found it to be another way of thinking about my work. Um, experimentation is a part of growth and development. So if you're challenging yourself and getting out there and trying a different material, then it could be an entry point into a new way of thinking or a way of approaching a problem that you've encountered in another medium in a different way. I, I just think that there's a lot of, as an emerging artist, there's a lot of malleability and, and playfulness that should be encouraged. And just sort of as a final point, I want to say that art, artwork is hard work. It's hard to maintain an art practice, uh, especially now, I think, having the time and the capacity to engage in creative things can be really difficult. And to recognize that you have to kind of be pulled along through this process and be healthy and, and content as well. So taking care of yourself is also hard work and something that should be articulated with artwork because often we love doing it and we like making things and it's restorative or exciting or, but, but I think recognizing that you don't have to apply for every call. You're not going to miss out on an opportunity necessarily if you let one of them slide. Um, it can feel like you just gotta have to grind, 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 
but I really think that there's a lot of opportunities out there and enough for every enough for things to go around and if we again if we think about work in an expanded type of way if we think of artwork in an expanded way reading a book can be maintaining an art practice so I just kind of wanted to say it's great to be an emerging artist but oftentimes your resources are run thin spread thin your time is really precious and it's important not to burn out uh, I don't really know how to do that, but I think just kind of trying to keep things in check is an important aspect. And that's, uh, that's it for, that's it. Uh, that's all I got. I, I hope that kind of gives a little bit of context for, um, for larger things. And I'm more than happy to chat about anything that you might have questions about if if there are specific things if in my limited capacity if I can answer them so thanks everybody thank you so much Kasha that was wonderful um yeah we'll just open up the floor to questions now if people have any um let me see here I know it can take a little while to type in the chat box so. yeah <laughs> If you're sweating trying to get your typos in a, removed, then don't worry. It's really such a nebul nebulous thing being an emerging artist. It's, there's lots of things to consider and think about. Um, so it's it's uh, can be tricky maybe. Oh, thanks, Cynthia. Cynthia just said thoughtful and informative. Thanks. Thanks, Cynthia. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like Zoom talks are yelling into the void because you're not quite sure if if your jokes are landing, which is what I'm mostly concerned about. <laughs> We're definitely landing. And we have Courtney who said, thank you, Kesha. I appreciate the notion of expanding your idea of what art practice and research can be. Thanks, Courtney. Yeah, I think it's, I think sometimes, and I do it too, where you, you think art making is one thing, but for me, art is really quite personal and really about experience and negotiating the world. And that's informed by books I read and, and TV shows I like to watch. and and all sorts of things. So I think research, when people say they have research based practices, I just think, oh, so you just, are you spending your time reading reading books and indulging in, in media that you find interesting or relevant? Cause that sounds like fun and like what everyone should be doing and is doing. <laughs> Maybe there's no questions. <laughs> I'm cool with that. I, I mean, I don't know if I have any answers. <laughs> All right, Tara. Oh, wait, it says someone's raised their hand. Oh, I didn't see that. And I do see another message from Christina. Okay. Rural juror. So that joke did land. Yes. <laughs> um, that's great information. I struggle with the CV without having an education in the arts and having very limited exhibition experience, especially when I feel like I'm not where I want to be with my work. Any advice? Um, that is a really hard thing. It is that catch-22 sort of situation because how do you prove you're worth somebody's time if you don't have these, these like lines in your CV? I think it's really, really such a tricky thing. And it's, it, it really is kind of about, it's so hard because saying make those opportunities for yourself is a little tricky. Um, I don't really think that you have to have an education in the arts to be successful in the arts. I, I think that that's a bit, um, I think that's a little too obvious and it's a little limiting, right? Because lots of people come from different, different avenues and different vocations and have found their way into art. I would say that often artist run centers, or I know, I don't know where you're from, Christina, but if you're from Lethbridge, 
There are auxiliary, as I mentioned, auxiliary spaces at the gallery, which are like small vitrines where, where I would say that the opportunity to come from a different background is, is definitely present. Um, it's, it's just really such a hard thing, but I think hitting up the places that are a little bit more malleable or a little bit less formal in, in, in type of processes, um, like coffee shops, if they ex exhibit art, that's a great avenue. Or um, there's a record shop in town that has exhibitions in their space. That's a great avenue. I don't know if they do formal calls, but kind of like looking for these, these, these beautiful little hidden sites where you can install your work and have fun and do problem solving as you set up your work and figure things out as, as you're installing them. I don't know if that's an answer. It's a really long answer, but it's a really complicated question and a complicated situation. Um, okay, that helps. I'm sorry. I hope it helps. Um, Kathy says, I like the practice of trying other mediums as they provide a jumping off point for new ideas. That's my mom, you guys. Kathy's my mom. Um, and I think it's a great example. My mom is teaching me how to knit. It can teach you different things. Um, I think it's, I think expanding the idea of your practice is a really important thing. It just encourages different ways of thinking and, and problem solving. Um, David Dunlop says, I was told my CV is more of a biography. Is there a clear difference in the two? Um, I would say there is a little bit of a difference, uh, mostly involved, involved with formatting. A biography, I would say, is more like a paragraph of maybe where you grew up or types of things that you're interested in doing. Um, if, if you've had any arts background or if you've attended workshops that are relevant to your practice. And a CV is really more like line by line item list of uh, things that you've done. So they're, they're both representations of, of biography and, and your career, but one I would say is more conversational, which is the biography. And one is really like bullet points what you've done, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, Courtney, how do you motivate yourself to do the admin work? What tips do you have to create space for the tasks that feel tedious or less fun? Oh, that is so hard. Um, I think, I think I have a really hard time motivating myself for, to do admin work. One of the things that helps is actually having a deadline. So understanding that, um, a, that, this application to submit for a performance art workshop or whatever it is that you have to have this this and this all together it's like a deadline is nothing better because you'll have to do it you have to submit it and even if it's not in the perfect most realized state that you would like it at least gets those kind of things under your belt um any actually i do have like a real tip for things to do. I have this app on my phone called B it's called BFT and it's, it, it's called a bear focus timer. And it you set a time limit. This is like you set a time limit and then you put your phone down and it plays. Oh, can you hear that? If you put it down, it plays like really nice audio of, of like a forest. And then when you pick it up, the bear is like slightly angry at you. And if you set it for 10 minutes and you just do it for 10 minutes admin work, honestly, how long does it take to send an email? I think for me, a lot of it is the nervousness about making sure that it's perfect and that things are making sense. But if you kind of let go of that and just, hey, I need to send an email, this is what it needs to be and not worrying so much about what they might think if you put an exclamation mark in there and just putting that exclamation mark in there. Honestly, it's exposure to having to do admin work that makes it less daunting, if that makes sense. Um, deadlines have always been a motivation for admin. Yeah, David, you're completely right. That's, I think without those, I mean, if inspiration strikes and you like to do admin work and, and reformatting your website is super 
feel super satisfying, great. But also having a deadline where you know someone's going to be looking at it because you've sent in an application and you think, oh, I've listed my website, they're gonna check it out. So I should have it maybe up to date. Um, I think I actually, through this process, realized that I need to update my CV. I need to do this and this and this. <laughs> and I reread my artist statement and was embarrassed. So I need to do a little bit of work myself. Uh, and I realized that through this process. <laughs> Yak, 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 right, guys? <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, Tara. So, you have... Yeah, so thank you, everybody, for joining us for uh, this session of artwork. Thank you, Kasha. That was a fantastic presentation, I think. So much <sighs> useful and practical information, and we're so lucky that uh, you were able to do this for us. And we appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to let everybody know uh, May 6th is our next, our next artwork. It's going to be called Discover Casa. So we're going to be walking through Casa, seeing all the facilities and all the opportunities that artists or just people in our community uh, have to uh, access. Hopefully we'll be open again soon at this rate. Who knows? But we're, we're hoping for the best. But again, that's May 6th. As well, uh, again, we are a member organization. Uh, please consider uh, joining uh, the Allied Earth Council. We really appreciate your membership. It helps us put on these sorts of free events like artwork and ongoing professional development. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe and yeah. enjoy yourselves. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.